All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to my uh, comrade in arms, Daniel Bryan, who's going to lead us through an AMA with the Block Science and Crypto Econ Lab teams. It's all you, Danny. Great. Wow, we're actually running a little bit early. Uh, that was not what I was expecting, but now I've had an hour's worth of coffee. Um, I think we're probably going to get through the next 60 minutes in about 30 seconds flat, which is good, actually, because the main thing that we wanted to do in this part of um, uh, this session is actually give room for uh, you in the audience to uh, contribute and ask questions. Um, Really, the point of this is, as you may or may not know, um, FIP0056 uh, is going through its last bit of process. Um, and uh, uh, we wanted to uh, try and bring everybody up to speed, anyone who's been involved, um, whether you're an SP, whether you're a core dev, whether you're a fill holder, um, whether you just like hanging out on GitHub, contributing to the discussions because you love the user interface so much. Um, uh, and it's been very fast moving. So just to give you some background, my name's Daniel Bryan. I'm at the Falcone Foundation, as I believe it probably says down there. Um, and uh, my job as senior fellow at the Falcone Foundation is to, I guess, worry right? Worry about all the things that could happen, what could happen um, under SDM, uh, FIT56, what happens if we don't pass FIT56, um, and try and keep abreast of all the information that's going on. And you may find yourself in a somewhat similar position. So things have changed a lot. Um, I think that uh, one of the biggest changes recently is the introduction of CDM. Um, for those of you not keeping up with the acronyms, uh, SDM is the sector duration multiplier proposal, which is FIT56. CDM is the capped duration multiplier uh, presented by Vivek and um, uh, Patrick uh, from F8. Um, so that crystallized a lot of discussion. Um, I think one of the things that we were really happy that we did at the foundation under the auspices of Caitlin and the governance team um, was to put out um, a, a call for block science, um, which is an independent crypto economic uh, unit to give an analysis of where everything stood um, in the last few weeks of uh, the process. So that's what we're going to have ostensibly. We're going to have a panel discussion between uh, uh, the block science team, uh, the crypto economic lab team, which, which who were the people who originally um, put the variables and put the proposal for SDM together. Um, it is an AMA. Um, it is ask me anything. Uh, there's no point asking me anything because I'm going to be asking questions too. But the me there is probably a we, right? It's everybody in this room. And as you've probably noticed in the chat, we have a lot of experts, including probably you, um, who have not only questions, but answers. But we are going to frame this around the structure of um, uh, the block science review. Let me just throw in a link, because as Galen says, uh, as an old Web2 head, I love my links. Um, feel free to flick through that in the next 30 seconds. Um, it, actually, I do really encourage you, if you do want to get up to speed in what's been happening, this is a brilliant summary, not only of um, the current situation, uh, but also how we got here. Um, it looks into CDM and SDM. It has not only some pretty graphs, but it also has, and I really recommend this, some calculators so you can play around with, with what-if scenarios. Um, and as I say, this is for those of you who've been craving um, an alternative view, uh, because I totally am aware that, that, that watching the whole discussion, uh, people come to it with their own points of view, um, and their own interests. We're all we all have different sub interests, um, even though we all want the network to succeed. So block science came to this relatively objectively. Um, they made some suggestions. They evaluated SDM. They compared it with CDM and actually played around with CDM's variables to see if they to make it more comparable. Um, they made some recommendations um, for what to do next, and they made some recommendations about governance. So uh, in the panel discussion, which will be for the next 10 minutes or so, um, 
I'm glad I had that extra four minutes so I could blather now. But in the next 10 minutes, we're not in this bit really going to delve into CDM. Uh, and we're not going to delve into governance and how we might make this process easier and less painful and uh, less drawn out in the future. That's not because those two things aren't really important. In fact, kind of the opposite. We kind of assume that if you have questions, those are the questions that you'll want to ask about, and we didn't want to lead that. Um, so uh, don't worry if you're sitting here listening to us talk and going crazy that we're not talking about uh, about those two things. Uh, we will, and we want that to be part of the future conversation. But we are going to delve into comparing SDM, um, uh, what's changed, where we are right now, and what the future might hold. And to do that, I'm going to do a fake panel introduction in Zoom, because what am I going to do? Like move their windows to the front of the screen. Um, uh, so I introduce to the virtual stale, say, stage, uh, Danilo Lessa Bernadelic, uh, who is uh, from uh, Block Science, and uh, Tom Mellon, uh, Vic Kauchagi, and ZX Chang Zhang from uh, um, from the Crypto Economic Lab from Cell. So uh, I guess you should just unmute. I think that's probably the the easiest way of doing it. Unmute, turn your video on, and like wave for the audience, everyone. All right. So I'm going to start by trying to give a little bit of the history so far. So I joined this debate, um, as many of us did, with FIP36, which was a crypt, I think one of the first post mainnet launch uh, major tweaks of uh, the crypto economic values for the network. Um, while people genuinely had businesses running on this uh, this machine. Um, I think one of the things that really started with the debate with FIT56 was um, a lot of folks um, uh, continuing conversation about FIT36. So I guess um, I, I, if, if, um, uh, if the cell folks want to just walk through, like, uh, what is the difference between FIT56 and FIT36? 36 and did fit 56 kind of has it also changed in response to feedback and fight amongst yourselves as to who should um should take this question um thanks danny um i think we will definitely speak to this and in terms of the difference in how duration incentives have evolved over time um i think we wanted to do first to start off uh with just providing some shared context uh amongst all of us here for the kind of motivation for duration incentives. Um, would you mind uh, walking through just uh, pressing the next slide and we can just kind of walk through that very quickly because um, that kind of helps us inform, you know, exactly why the policy has kind of changed over over the, you know, course Ooh, of the- Oh, extra six, slides, six excellent. Go for extra it. Extra slides, but they'll be short, I promise. Um, so uh, the, to take a step back, why do we uh, kind of think about or want duration incentives on the network? Uh, what purpose or use case could they serve and how could they help us kind of further the mission of uh, the Falcoins, you know, decentralized storage uh, future. Um, so there are a couple of things that, you know, when we were looking, when people, uh, Crypto Econ Lab and others were looking at duration incentives uh, last summer and, and, and spring, there was this idea that the current network parameters kind of incentivize these shorter term behaviors and alignment on the network, by which I mean, uh, you can commit a sector for a shorter period of time and then that kind of expires off. And these have second order effects. It's when it comes to the stability of Filecoin's economy and specifically the lock supply. Um, and also if our kind of vision is to be a robust foundation for humanities um, information, uh, we should also care about uh, the, the, that kind of persisting over time. And therefore we think that there is a possibility to add this uh, additional incentive on top of those existing ones to have a slight preference towards uh, committing storage capacity as well as data to the network for a longer period of time. Um, I think the important caveat here was that we also didn't want to break relative incentives um, because at first and foremost, Filecoin is a decentralized data storage network. Filecoin Plus is a crucial part of that, um, uh, of, of that story. And so while we wanna add this incentive overlay, we wanted to maintain the fact that there should also be a preference for uh, data being stored, uh, real useful data being stored on the network. 
Um, so can we go to the next slide, please, Danny? So that kind of led us to uh, the policy that, that kind of exists, um, which is we want to be introduced the sector duration multiplier um, for all sectors, regardless of type and what's stored in that. Um, the really the large changes that that have that have that have existed now in the current draft of FIP fifty six, which is in um, last call right now, uh, is the minimum sector duration time is increased from six months to a year, and the maximum sector duration uh, has increased to five years. Um, now. There's also this added component, which is that sectors with larger durations uh, will also have a higher quality adjusted power or QAP um, uh, and a uh, commensurate increase, increase in the uh, initial pledge. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Danny? So this, I think, so that was like the brief kind of introduction. And this is like that to answer your earlier question, like how is this debate uh, and how has this evolved over time? So. We started with uh, FIP 36, which was the initial uh, uh, kind of uh, iteration of duration incentives, but had some other things kind of attached to it. Um, and then we've kind of arrived at this, this final version, which is uh, very different from the policy that was initially proposed in the summer. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that we've received a lot of feedback from the community um, and in particular storage provider working groups about the nature of the policy and how it kind of fits into their existing models. Um, and two, because um, economic conditions uh, kind of can, uh, can can change, and we have to be kind of adaptive to fast changing economic circumstances. By which I mean uh, the way the world looked in the summer of 2022, and the way the world and the way the world looks now are um, incredibly vastly different. Um, and uh, Filecoin's economy kind of fits into not just the broader uh, crypto crypto economic or cryptocurrency environment, but also the global macroeconomic environment as well. So we want to be very, very careful and have this kind of uh, very uh, uh, precautionary and scientific ap approach to uh, the policies that we kind of submit to the network. So as a result, uh, 50, 56 is um, a fairly mild uh, change from the status quo in the sense that it maintains relative incentives like build plus incentives for uh, kind of storing useful data, and then has a slight tilt towards um, uh, longer uh, uh, incentives for, for longer durations that were not as pronounced as in previous iterations uh, of the sector duration multiplier policy. Um, that's kind of that introduction. I think uh, we can go on to further questions. I think Danilo was going to speak a little bit upon, um, you know, block sciences um, analysis and as well as some like kind of common misconceptions, which, which we can weave into your questions as well, Danny. Um, but I think just to set the stage for, for why we are where we are in terms of last call for SDM, just wanted to, to make sure we were on the same page. So thanks for giving me the time. So definitely one of the things that got like immediate put back, pushback in FIP 36 was how the termination fees, how the consensus pledge was going to affect existing sort of SPs models. Um, is is it, it, did that sort of get, get kind of stripped away a little bit with FIP56 if the aim of it was primarily just to encourage greater and long-term um, uh, storage, like that seems to be one of the things that's modified it. I'm sorry, I'm just sort of channeling my inner SP here, right? Sure, oh, yeah. so I think, I think the thing we want to kind of talk about is there were so so true, right. There were some initial concerns, right, about um, things like initial pledge increases, et cetera. And you can kind of chain, you can kind of see that in the evolution of the duration incentives policy over time and what things have been added and removed. I think the 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 biggest thing is uh, in the FIT 36 initial draft and final draft, there was a parameter change to the target lock supply um, uh, kind of constant, which would have increased initial pledges. Um, uh, all else equal. So it would have been a 66% increase in initial pledges for a given sector um, because we are, we kind of scale that constant up. Uh, that was debated fairly extensively with uh, storage provider working groups. Um, and while there can be changes to um, the lock parameter in the future and in, in, in a more maybe dynamic or responsive way, uh, that is not considered at all in FIT 56. And therefore we are kind of leaving initial pledges um, alone in terms of how they're, they're calculated. Um, there was a, uh, so 
that I think that kind of was the question regarding uh, the, the initial pledge change and, and which is also informed by the FIP kind of stands where it is now. Right. So I think the conversation has sort of shifted. And again, I'm just trying to bring people up to speed. And I mean, I've definitely noticed in the last few weeks, and this is one of the reasons I think why CDM appeared, is much more into like what should be the balance between Phil Plus and committed sectors. And Danilo, if I can bring you in here, like one, I think one of the things that surprised me in your analysis was sort of running through some of these arguments that were being made and picking out the ones that, yes, did, you know, were reflected in 56 and the ones that actually um, uh, either counterintuitively or just because it was a 36 thing that didn't really transfer um, didn't apply. Can you can you walk through kind of the points of agreement, I guess you have with Crypto Economic Lab, and then we can talk about some of the, the differences. Sure, uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think it is an uh, important distillation point because 5056 is very different compared to 36. Uh, in terms of macroeconomic uh, mechanisms, consensus pledge is one of the most important ones in how you shape the token distribution. Because this is removed, this simply cannot compare the two proposals. Uh, 56 is way, way gentler. And one thing that we did this still on the analysis is the following, because when you change the consensus pledge, you are also changing the permanent trend on the locked file coin. And 56 only changes the, quap, the quality adjusted power distribution. So on the debate, on the public forum's discussion, someone did do a knowledge that I kind of like that quality adjusted power is just lot, like lottery tickets in terms of who gets the rewards and how much collateral you must uh, pay. And I mean, as we are going to see here on the other arguments, so one that I, I, I please on the next slide, but I'll go to that shortly is that the token distribution can change transiently, but it's going to be a small change and it's not going to be forever. It's going to quickly wash off. And while 56 would induce a permanent change on that. So just by that, 56 is, as I said before, it's a different piece. There is the crap share. And one important thing that, I mean, an important point of agreement between us and CryptoCon Lab is about the general principles on how you reshuffle that quality adjusted power. So first one is about uh, 56 uh, respects the principle that bought longer duration, bought more file coin plus is better. And there is an important thing here, which is what logical operator you do. Because you, let's say you do have the logical or, which is if you increase duration is better, if you increase file coin plus better, and if you increase bot, it's even better. Or you can do an end operation, like, Either one is good, better, or other one is better, but you cannot have the two. And 56 respects the principle of the logical or operation. There is also the one that 56 uh, tends to favor long duration capacity commuters. Uh, of course, there are some assumptions like uh, the same risk aversion and so on. But the idea is that making a sector longer, it's always on the criteria of the storage provider. But at the same time, uh, taking a longer deal is not under his control. It's actually under the control of the client. So all things being equal, the capacity committer does have more degree of freedom. And because the 56 is a logical or, uh, we tend to expect that, let's say, marginally speaking, capacity committers can have more crap share after uh, the 56 is implemented. Uh, and that's in line of the other argument, like if 56 is not, we are not expected to skew the token wealth distribution. So we do not expect uh, storage providers that are Filecoin Plus to become marginally, let's say, richer in the token sense compared to capacity committers. We actually expect capacity committers to benefit the most from that. Can I, can I jump and... in here? Because this is, this, is this is a little hard to, to wrap your head around. So what you're saying is, is that if 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 SDM passed, right? If we did if we did change these variables, like it looks like that it would end up moving, incentivizing people to go to the 
plus just sort of, you know, I have to get this straight. Like it, it, there would be a tendency for, for things to go towards Phil plus, but actually because folks who are committing sectors um, have a lot more choice about what they do because they're not responding to clients, they can sort of fight back as it were. They can, they can um, decide, okay, we're going to try and get more um, uh, rewards by extending um, the duration of our commitments. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And this okay. is going to be the topic of the next slide. Of course, there are oh, some <laughs> assumptions in here. Uh, but I don't know, uh, go to the previous slide because we still have some meetings. So, so the last three meetings is modification to termination fees could be a standalone theme. So there is some meeting or analysis because the way that the proposal is as it is now, the termination fee is going to increase uh, faster than your rewards and collateral. So if your rewards increase by 2x, the termination fee is going to increase by like 3.5x, something like that. Uh, so this is a thing of concern. We don't think it has been discussed enough. And so we did suggest that this could be a standalone fee and we kind of did agree on that. And the last two items, so larger slopes. So larger slopes, they tend to cause more abrupt effects in terms of incentives. Uh, also, how much Filecoin would be locked temporarily. By temporarily, I mean something like three or six months. It's hard to put a number without explicit assumptions, but it's on that sense. And another point of agreement is the need to have open source and reproducible analysis that people on reasonable time and expertise can reproduce, input their assumptions, and get their own interpretations about that. And next slide, please. And yeah, we can move to the common misconceptions. So first one was addressed about 56 being just a 36 with another name. As, as we did show on the table, this discuss here, it's way, way gentler. The one about 56 being biased towards Filecoin Plus. Uh, on our technical analysis, we did conclude that this is most not true. The only condition on that on which this would not so the only condition on which that would be false is if somehow capex committers are more risk averse than Filecoin Plus dealers. And this is a strong assumption. Of course, this is also the key of the or disagreement about the thesis because there is a thesis that has been propagated, which we do think it represents a catastrophic risk. Uh, the, the, the question is not that we agree or disagree with that thesis. The question is we could not disprove it. And because we couldn't disprove it, uh, we, uh, we used the precautionary principle, but we can discuss that uh, later. There is also the misconception of PIP56 substantially increasing the collateral requirements. Uh, on our technical analysis, we do provide a consensus pledge educational calculator. You can try to simulate what happens if the quality factor goes up by 2x over six months. Uh, it's not going to change substantially and it's going to wash off after, after some time. Uh, and also PIP56 not providing alternatives for non 5 point plus sectors. I do not agree with that because you are actually adding a new dimension on which you can act on. Because right now you can only have the same, uh, I mean, there is not a lot of advantage on you having a longer sector. Uh, PIP56 adds another dimension here. So yes, it's, and also the mixture of strategies that you could do. And yeah, that's it from my side. And okay, so, uh, let me drill down to some of this stuff, right? Which is so, um, I mean, just basically kind of summarizing for my, my own purpose here, it feels like, uh, first of all, FIT56 isn't, isn't quite a, as, as dramatic uh, an effect for SPs. Um, some of the stuff that people have been talking about that it's just going to really um, uh, stop uh, just committing sectors being a, a viable alternative or even making market deals to to fill plus. So those that those big worries don't seem to be uh, reflected in the in the proposal. Um, Scott asked um, uh, in the in the chat, well, okay, I'm presuming this is what Scott was asking, is that like 
isn't kind of part of the point of this to try and encourage people to move to actual deals rather than committing sectors um uh like it it it, it seems a little and, and maybe you can address this because i think this is like yes part of this I, question I, I people question. have i Sorry, i understand ahead. the confusion <laughs> Okay. So <laughs> let, let's let's go to the previous slide. So uh, I don't I don't understand the conclusion because it seems somewhat contradictory. Because on one hand, 56 respects the principle that more five point plus is better, but at the same time, we are saying that the incentives tend to favor long duration CCs. Uh, so there is a bit of a catch here because we must compare to what it is now. Uh, so right now, uh, let's say, let's suppose a sector that's fully Filecoin Plus and the CC sector. Filecoin Plus sector is going to have 10x and CC is going to have one. And then we did approve 5056. What's going to happen is that if both the CC and both the 100% Filecoin Plus sector maxes out the sector duration, their relative incentives is the same in terms of rewards and also stage. But there is also the catch that it's harder for a Filecoin Plus sector to max out the duration. Because I said before, the SEC is free to choose the duration. The Filecoin Plus put it only, not necessarily. So it respects the principle that, let's say, if you go on any direction, it's better. But on practice, given, those, uh, given that you are not completely to choose the direction, we expect that the actual incentives will favor long duration CCs. So in that sense, I, I would not consider 5056 a pro Filecoin Plus uh, proposal. I consider it a proposal to introduce an incentive for long duration sectors. Okay. Okay. So, so basically there's sort of this deal, like you can do fill plus, but you can kind of compensate by having longer duration. And the reason why the network benefits from longer duration is kind of both to introduce stability and stop. Um, there was this great graph that actually, Vic, that I don't know whether we can jump to this slide. I don't actually control the slides. Um, Caitlin, I'm sorry. But like there was a, an image that you had maybe in, um, in your response that showed the expiration rate of sectors, um, both without SDM and before SDM. And that seems to be one of the reasons why, like there's this sort of time pressure for SDM. Can somebody uh, from, uh, from the Crypto Icon Lab kind of talk about that? Vic, you look totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to recall which which graph or let me you're, let me see if I, I will I will I will dig it up. But like, let's talk about this sector expiration rate a little bit because that seemed to be one of the big reasons to do this that hasn't been talked about enough. Like, why are sectors expiring bad, and why do you want to incentivize greater locking of um, of sectors? Ah, okay, yeah, I can speak to that briefly and maybe Tom or you guys can chime in if there's something I miss. Um, but um, the idea is that um, what you kind of want is there's a consequence to sector churn. And by sector churn, I mean this idea that you have a sector on board and then it kind of expires quickly, like uh, in some time horizon that's fairly, fairly quick. Um, because that means that there needs to be like a fairly high onboarding rate to compensate for all these sectors leaving the network. And the consequence of sectors leaving the network is um, you have uh, less stability in the lock supply of Filecoin. So you have less stability in the amount of kind of capital that is flowing into and invested in securing and um, uh, kind of furthering the, the Filecoin economy. So the, the, the idea of expirations is, expiration is just another word for turn, right? So the way that we think about duration incentives is to when you uh, kind of introduce your sectors for a longer period of time, you're kind of decreasing your churn rate off the network and you're committing your re resources to the network for a longer period of time. Uh, as a result, there should also be some kind of additional compensation that comes along with that. Um, does that answer the question or is there something else um, you were kind of looking for there? Uh, no, that's 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 great. And actually I found the image, it was actually in, uh, in your response. So, um, 
I'm, I'd like to kind of get towards um, us opening up for other people's uh, questions here. But um, uh, one of the things that I know deaf people definitely in the chat have a question about is the, you said it doesn't increase collateral substantially. Um, and Bob Dubois says uh, a two times increase is actually pretty, pretty significant if you're the person paying up collateral. Um, is that figure, um, how is that figure going to kick in? Like, is that something that happens in 24 hours? Are there mitigations that mean it's, uh, it's less of a hardship for SPs? Uh, I can answer that. So it's a bit tricky to answer exactly without going on the simulations, and that's why we built an educational calculator. But the thing is, if SDM is implemented and the quality average quality factor of the network goes up, what is going to happen is that the increased uh, cap will reduce the collateral requirements because most of the collateral requirements are due to the consensus pledge, which depends essentially. On the, on the circulating supply. So uh, there is sort of a transient shift that the first ones to, to upgrade, they can pay proportionally more collateral, but the network is going to quickly adjust. As for how much it, it would take, it, it's, it's hard to go without doing formal assumptions on how it's going to be. Uh, I do not expect to be, on the simulations that I did, I do not expect that to endure more than, let's say, one year or two years. And everything is going to go very. So, so yeah, it's, it's hard to put a number, but any increase is going to be temporary. I think that this is the best answer that I can provide. And it's not going to be more than, let's say, six months. So, I think this is one of the things that people have concerns about is that when um, uh, when you're playing around with these variables, um, there are a lot of question marks over it, right? And it's very hard to, I think one of the the, the comments that Danilo's team made in, um, in the document was, you know, a tiny change in these variables can have consequences. And it's very hard for an outsider who isn't a crypto econ economist to kind of play with those variables themselves. I think one of the reasons why CDM was so popular is that it changed some of those variables and people began to think about that. Vic, is there a way that, that or actually both of you, that um, uh, people outside of Econ Labs can get an opportunity to toy with these variables themselves and see what some of the assumptions you're making are? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so one, one big thing that we kind of care about um, at CL and definitely Block Science as well as uh, reproducibility and open sourcing the work that we do. So I know Block Science has some calculators that they've open sourced. Uh, Crypto Econ Lab also has um, an open source package called Megafill, um, which I can link um, in the chat. Uh, Tom, Kieran, and Maria from uh, Crypto Econ Lab have, have produced this package in which you can kind of simulate um different uh the exactly exactly what you kind of said which is like these different tuning these different parameters and how they kind of can affect the uh the uh the economy over over time um also many of the analysis that crypto econ lab has done um is linked in uh open source notebooks jupyter notebooks that you can also play with and you know make your own assumptions for as well um so the short answer is anything that we do we want you to you to be able to do too so we have, we've open source all that work um, okay, so I have a couple of like the questions that I know get we get asked like all the time. Um, and I think what one of the first ones is gonna be um if you go on GitHub, um Pip56 gets lots of comments, people going, oh, I'm not sure about this. When CDN came along, like the GitHub commusing community were like, oh yeah, this is great. Um uh why don't we just do what people want <laughs> and, and implement CDM? I'm going to start with you, Danilo, because actually you, you gave CDM some analysis um, and your recommendation was not, was not that. So why didn't, why didn't um, 
uh, uh, block science favor CDM in the end? Uh, favors uh, uh, so our recommendation was that so it's a bit tricky because from an engineering ethics when you do a technical review you can never recommend anyone because it's the whole of the political process to decide whatever it's best for the participants so it's not our role to say this is best and this is worse uh, what we can do is first try to clarify what the proposals are and what they cause. And if the debate is being fair to what's being proposed and also provide any general recommendations about how to, I mean, smooth into the bet and so on. Another type of recommendation that we can do given that we can never say, yes, please do that. We can, if there are concerns, like if there is some kind of thesis that on our opinion, can generate harm to the network if it's true. If we see the potential for generating harm, then it's on the engineering ethic obligation to say postpone or reject. I'm saying all of that because we are not, so in a certain sense, we are not endorsing any proposal. We are not saying to adopt PPP6 or CDM or whatever like that. Uh, and given our description, uh, I mean, they are going to generate different incentives. It's not up to us to say which incentives is best. The best that we can do is simply say, those are the consequences. This is how the participants are probably going to, to feel. And if we see a risk, we say postpone or reject while we have more discussions. And we do, uh, I mean, or at least uh, try to do research on the risk so that we eliminate the risk beforehand. So, that's true. I, I think one of the things, though, that the the um, block science report did say is conditional on one of the points that the CDM uh, paper um, advocated or, or made. Um, the precautionary principle that you both described was actually meant that you should postpone SDM um, uh, uh, for now. So Vic, why, why, I mean, presumably you're still, you're still, uh, CEL is still a fan of SDM. Why, um, why not postpone? Why not do what block science um, suggests there? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we actually have a slide on this that Tom would, might, might speak over for a little bit more. So if you wanna go two, I think down or one down, we'll see if I'm, which one it is, um, but, the sh even if we can't get to there, the, the short answer is um, there are a couple of things. Um, the first is that when it comes to what you know, Danilo just kind of brought up and, and mentioned regarding block science's assessment of the CDM policy and the SCM policy, there's also this like higher order consideration, which is where do we want to go as a network and what are our overarching overarching kind of goals? Um, and and useful data in Phil Plus is like a crucial component of that storyline. And as a result, we want to be um, fairly critical of policies that kind of shy away from that vision and disincentivize um, that kind of behavior. Um, the behavior being going through the work to uh, interact with clients and onboard useful data. So we think that's like kind of one of the crucial distinctions on the more like philosophical and motivational perspective between these two policies. Now, the precautionary principle, um, I I think what we um, Okay, um, I guess we, we we can't get to the slide, but no worries. Um, but uh, the uh, the precautionary principle. Just oh, no, kind of I'm said, not. I I I don't have control, so I'm going to go. Caitlin, can you move the slides across um, a couple more? Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more. So I guess I was wrong. It was three. Um, so Tom, I guess if you want to uh, talk over this a bit, I'm happy to pass the mic. Um, but I think we have. We have our kind of views on both. I think crypto econ lab and block science agree um, at the higher order level that we should have a fair amount of confidence and stress testing of economic policies that we want to introduce to the network. Uh, the precautionary approach just states that we want to have a good handle on the range of possible outcomes, um, as well as understand very deeply the trade offs and the risk spaces that we are incurring when we propose a policy. The divergence so, is not in the approach, but in the conclusion. Uh, which is kind of where we think we fall in terms of our understanding of the SDM um, and its kind of inclusion in the network. 
but I'll pass the mic to Tom who can speak more on this. Uh, yeah, sure. I can, I can speak a little bit more to that. And I can also look back to the original question just before this, which was why not just implement CDM right now as it is? And the reasons for that uh, are twofold, really. Uh, one is uh, one type of reason is technical, and the other is more uh, in terms of the direction that we want to go in in a network, which is something we should discuss here. So the, the first set of reasons are that CDM, as it's currently formulated, there's a substantial risk of uh, shrinking the raw by power if it was implemented today as, as it is. No, it doesn't have to be implemented today. There could be modifications, but the key point that I'm making is that it's quite early stage and there's still a lot of iteration needed to get it to, get it to where it, it is. And then the, first, the other point was more in terms of uh, direction and, and we just heard uh, about how Phil Plus is really the key mechanism that we have to make Filecoin a data storage uh, network and how that's progressing uh, but um, to, to move on from that although we can discuss it more but to move on from that uh, and talk about the cautionary principle so I mean Danilo's done an excellent job there um, but we definitely don't um, agree on everything I mean I, I really respect his technical analysis and I think it's excellent but the kind of key thing that we do disagree on is on the application of the precautionary principle um, so just as an additional introduction to what Vic has said what is the precautionary principle to start off with well it is the principle that if a policy change has the potential to cause harm, then we are obliged to delay implementing that policy until we can find and generate sound and sufficient scientific evidence that there will be no harm. So that's kind of the key point. And uh, two good examples of this. So th three years ago this week, uh, there was an unprecedented public health intervention, which you all might remember. That um, is, is an example of the cautionary principle. And, and again, today we see it in another case um, in the AI letter from Steve uh, Wozniak and Gary Marcus and a few others. This is, in a sense, uh, an attempt to apply the precautionary principle. In short, it's asking to slow down and really examine the risk benefit calculus and where do we stand. So. Um, on this, we, we, we disagree. So uh, in, in terms of cell and block science's differing positions, block science argues that uh, we, we don't have enough knowledge right now to be confident to, uh, uh, to move forward with the fit, whereas cell believes uh, we have explicitly applied the precautionary principle this has been absolutely at the forefront of our minds and has been for months. And this is why, through rounds of change and lowering the slope um, and multiple simulations, this in our mind is exactly what applying the precautionary principle means. So, I mean, that's kind of like a summary. Um, if, if anybody disagrees with that, um, perhaps we can try to unpack a little bit more why um, block science and crypto econ lab disagree um, we, we have a chance for some dialogue here and per, potentially we can draw things closer together and understand why we might be disagreeing um, and what either side is potentially missing uh, so feel free to jump in danilo if you think i, I haven't summarized things well so far okay good <laughs> thank you uh, so i mean in terms of unpacking the precautionary principle a challenge when applying it is always that you have a, a vague risk that cannot be substantiated. And this leaves us in a kind of limbo. It leaves us in a kind of paralyzed situation where we cannot progress. So in order for the precautionary principle to be useful, uh, it, it has to have a practical uh, framework and define thresholds for actually moving forward. Uh, otherwise, the precautionary principle is simply not your thought. So you have to have a, a practical way of applying it. So this is precisely what we, we try to do. So we model uh, we model a whole bunch of things, different observables, power observables, so raw by power, quality adjusted power. We model Filecoin's macro, so locking, circulating supply, minting. We model Filecoin's storage provider, econometrics, so returns, initial pledge. 
and we consider these different observables and we consider them across different macro scenarios outside of Filecoin as well, optimistic scenarios, pessimistic scenarios. And then we try to examine how the whole system responds if the policy changes, ends up changing average duration to two years, three years, four years, five years. And across these different system responses, we then examine different policies. So a whole range of different potential SDM parameterizations. Do we want slope one, slightly less, and so forth? And across all of these policies, different macro scenarios, observables, we look at this through time. And this is the basic framework, and this is the approach. And based on this, we have a set of thresholds and numbers that we try to target. For example, we try to come up with a policy that ensures that in the worst possible case scenario, that there cannot be uh, an excessive risk to, for example, raw by power, which is, which is the main point of contention here. My duration incentives uh, cause uh, a risk to raw by consolidation. There is that risk, that risk exists with slope one, but it is massively mitigated with slope 0 0.28, which is a maximum okay. multiplier of two. two. So, yeah, sorry, I'm going on, go ahead, so Danny. Yeah, yeah. So, Tom, I, I just I, do, I don't want to hurry you, but I do want room for people to do spoken questions. But to kind of summarize what you're saying is that the block science proposal was um, we should be careful. You're sort of saying we actually did calculate a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, in particular, though, like the block science argument was taken from CDM and it was about it was basically saying the tech isn't ready yet. Right. Is that a fair way of saying it? That like this is a deliberate attempt to move um, the network towards being uh, a storage, a, a public storage system um, rather than having internal incentives. And the thing that is unclear is whether the technology is there to do that. Um, do you do you feel the technology is ready or do you feel that that's irrelevant? So, so on our article, there is a full description of the thesis as propagated by the SDM proponents. Essentially, the right. argument, as you said, is they argue that the technology is not ready yet. And because of that and of the conditions, uh, there is the risk of having a network uh, shrink shrinkage. And, and if we understand Filecoin's home bikes power as being a comparative advantage right now, it's on our interest to conserve that as much as possible in a certain sense to, by keeping or ever increasing the incentives towards the Humbard bikes pro, power providers. And the thing about this thesis is, it's not that we think that it's true or false. We do not have any judgment about that. Uh, but the thing is, the, the argument is, is if you change the economic calculus of them anyhow, if it's already hard, uh, what is going to happen is that these proposals do is modify their calculus. So I thought capacity committers tend to be benefited from a crap share. There are other aspects too, like for example, increasing the sector duration. And the thing is, in order for you to engage on any project or any entrepreneurship, the way that you move forward is you, cap you compute the net present value. You do have a discount rate. You, you have an estimation of what's your expected return rates per year. And this depends on time too. Uh, and I'm saying all of that, not because I do know what's the discount rate, or uh, I do not actually know what's the situation. And because I do not actually know, and they did put this post potentially catastrophic risk that there is a shrinkage, because I do not have data about that, mm -hmm. uh, my, and this is a catastrophic risk, the only thing that I can recommend is postpone until we get to learn more it may be that this test is, is unfounded. Uh, I do not have any reason to think that it's true or false, but I cannot mm -hmm. disprove it. And that's the point. So uh, and, we have, yeah. yeah. So we, I, I mean, this is always the limits of, of these sort of analysis is that we have the luxury to go, uh, this is the limit of it. Um, our audience is full of people who maybe don't have that luxury. Um, there's been a really great discussion in the chat and I'm sort of actually loath to um, to just pluck questions out from there. 
Um, but if anybody wants to actually speak up and ask the panel, if you uh, raise your hands, uh, I can um, I can uh, uh, let you speak, or in fact, you could just speak up. <laughs> Is anybody wanting to speak up? I just actually managed to expand my window at exactly the wrong moment. Hold on. Uh, I see Juan has a hand up. Oh, but... yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I'll let Juan topic. speak. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, and thanks so much for the discussion. It's great. Um, just ver and very on topic question, just as a follow up. Um, uh, I, I like both. Uh, I'd like to ask the question to both both uh, Block Science and, and Crypto Ecom Lab. Uh, considering cloud storage networks and the changes in features and uh, economic policies that they might have and their growth over time to adapt to the market. What do you think is an adequate amount of improvement and changes to the Filecoin network over time? And, and how does that relate to the to the precautionary principle? Danilo, do you want to take that on? Yeah, so it's a uh... It's a bit hard to me to give any answer without doing a true review. But one thing that we did put on our review is that on long term, we do need to generate new revenue because what's what's going to make the network sustainable is for you to have these cycles between storage provider, secondary market, and clients that put uh, file coin. This is what is going to generate long term sustainability. Uh, in terms of what needs to be done, so. I do not have any specific proposal because, I mean, uh, I'm an engineer and I follow the engineering ethics, so I did, for anything, I, I do need, for example, to have a statement, like, this is the optimization problem, this is our constraints, this is the rules of the games, and let's do a true study about that. Uh, I cannot go beyond that. No, sorry, I, I don't know if I, uh, my question got um, across well. Let me try it again. So. Um, Cloud storage networks have to adapt to the changing market very quickly in order to adapt to the market of consumers and clients that they're trying to sell to. And they have to adapt in terms of the features they offer, in terms of the uh, um, economic conditions of their and, and their internal policies of, on how they run their facilities, and they have to adapt their offerings. Um, and so based on what you know about uh, cloud networks and cloud storage systems and so on, um, and their improvement rates and changes over time on a yearly, monthly, yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly basis. What do you think is an appropriate rate of improvement for the Falcon network? Uh, I mean, there's a very difficult question to answer, but I can just like give an, another perspective on it. And that is just to say that inaction in particular does carry a risk. Inaction is an act of choice. And if, if we choose not to uh, evolve the, the network's economic policies in tandem alongside the technology that's evolving, I mean, we, we shouldn't take that for granted necessarily. So yeah. I have a question for, for, for actually Juan and, and, and Tom and, and maybe Dana, which is that, so a lot of this discussion is about changing some basic variables of the network. Um, is the process that you've gone through now kind of a continuation of what was done when mainnet was launched, or th is this a new endeavor? Um, wh which is to say, you know, how did you pick those numbers in the beginning? And are you tweaking them now, or is this really a, a new uh, a new thing you're considering? And Juan, I guess like you're the obvious person to ask this to. Yeah, I can, I can give a give a view, kind of like initially of the parameters uh, and and so on. I think the goal, our long term goal, should be to find really good dynamic parameter sets that can adapt to a wide variety of circumstances where you don't have constants that assume something about the world because the world is going to continue changing and you don't want constants. Um, uh, usually you want uh, dynamic parameters that will adapt. Now, unfortunately, the world sometimes will change so much that entire mechanisms and entire ranges of dynamic parameters will have to change. So change is inevitable. Like even if you do a ton of work to make dynamic parameters, you'll still have to change things, uh, but hopefully you'll change them less. Uh, unfortunately, due to timing, uh, a lot of the five-point parameters have constants in them. And it's not great. Like I think this is a, a a thing that over time we should be moving towards dynamic parameters as much as we can. Um, the initial parameter set for 
uh, a number of things was based on um, a lot of study at the time and good, good, really good guesses, like well-informed good guesses that have worked out in, in my view, like way better than, than expected in a lot of cases. There are other parameters that haven't worked out, worked as well. And so some tweaks uh, will have to be done over time. Now, I think what we should be moving towards as a network is getting to the dynamic parameters. Um, and, and I think well, there are probably much more, there, there are probably much many more parameters that likely should adapt faster than what what, um, what anybody's proposing. Uh, yeah, and the one really quick thing I'd add on there is it's also good with, so it's kind of moved towards dynamic parameters, but then also if you are kind of, um, not force, but at the moment have like a limited range of, of optionality. Let's say you have some kind of constant parameter set. You want to allow that, allow a certain degree of flexibility within that, so that markets can like markets can adapt within that existing set of options that you you've kind of given, right? So, if there are like limitations to like the way that markets can form in terms of um, the data economy that Falcon's being created, you at least at the very least want to have um, allow for optionality between storage provider and client, etc., uh, so that you know, the market itself can kind of organically adapt based on, you know, changing conditions. Um, I think that's part of the motivation that influences like this fit and, and, and others that we will see coming from the crypto econ lab team and others. But uh, that's a really good framework to have, which is how do we know we've kind of succeeded from an economic perspective, which is that um, there's almost this like automatic stabilizing component to the, the crypto economic uh, constructions that, that persist over time. So there is a lot of stability in the network. And I think one of the reasons why there's so much discussion and concern about these crypto economic proposals is a worry that there'll be a kind of discontinuity, right? That, that not only things will change, but they'll change in a way that it will be very hard for businesses to, um, to take into account. Um, I'm presuming that you don't think that that will happen, <laughs> but um, if it does, if something does happen, do you feel confident that you can that that there are things that could be done new FIPS uh, in the future that could um, uh, uh, shift or, or or mitigate those? And, and what kind what kind of things are you worried about? What kind of things are you thinking about in the next six months? I guess this is to the crypto eco econ lab. Um, so, so the main worry, maybe I can, sorry, uh, I'll just say one. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead so, yeah. So, yeah. So the main risk that we've been thinking about and working to mitigate and minimize has been the potential for uh, uh, raw bite to dip. Uh, so, but that broadly is uh, really minimized with a lower slope. Um, and another thing to be cautious of is that we could potentially overpower uh, CC with this FIP whenever that's not really uh, aligned with the direction that we want to go in. So that's something to be cautious of and aware of as well. But again, that's massively mitigated by the lower slope. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I also want, yeah, wanted to add, maybe to answer some of the other earlier questions too, where right? like, um, again, I think why I was just reflecting on why we started working on Falcon in the first place, right? Maybe that's the case for many people here as well, right? It's, it's a blockchain network that tries to do something that tries to be, that has a mission that wants to do useful stuff, right? Useful work. So, um, and because the blockchain takes on a higher, kind of a greater aspiration, right? That's why we do all this like ZK technology. Uh, we actually spend a lot of effort understanding monitoring and simulating the economy. And, um, and, and we also have pretty stiff competition, right? To answer that one question or even or partially, right? Like the world is changing very quickly, right? The entire cloud industry was built in the last like 20 years when right? people are, just competing, right? Like and moving very, very quickly. Um, and in some sense, like to be fair and honest, I don't think our group really wants to put up more economic fit, where right? we don't want policy changes. We want businesses to have the continuity. We want people to be uh, to be like be able to make predictable business decision, right? That's we actually take that pretty seriously. That's why we really haven't heard from us like much, like in the last like three years also when the network is running. Um, but at the same time, we must be ready to adapt, right? Like, and even like making parameters dynamic is also not easy. You know, there is some kind of constant in some of these uh, principles too, that we need to articulate those principles and how do we make sure um, the dynamic parameters is like reflecting that principle. But um, having said that, right? Like, um, 
but when let's say when the needs really call for it, right? There is potentially some um, drastic change in the world, right? Like shifting macro environments or like a stiff competition appear uh, in horizon. Like we should be ready to like make uh, changes uh, for the short term survival of the network, right? And um, and some of the other work, even like pre launch, uh, we actually do simulation. Right now, we do even greater level of simulation. We also like our team. Um, open source the simulator so that people can participate uh, in it and really understand what's going on. We work a lot on the education to make sure that we um, more people understand the economics of the network. Um, so we um, so uh, do, 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 do yeah. So that is to answer like Danny's point earlier about like um, like in terms of are we doing something new and so on and so forth. But also just to um, kind of to call out too right like we. Our philosophy of design economic system is to try to like design a structure first. So you know exactly which are the control points. I think Donello was very deeply heavily involved when we were designing the network as well. So we know kind of like these are the knobs that we are turning um, that will affect which part of the system and which other parts of the system that are interconnected. Right now we have a team at Crypto Econ Lab to understand the more people understand all the dynamics understand the different knobs. And then we also hope to like share the knowledge more with our community. Um, and yeah, so in some sense, it's not so so much of like, oh, we just thought of this thing or like, oh, we, oh, why do we know which knobs to turn? But because like when we design the system, we put place uh, knobs in place that we know, okay, if we need a fast response, which knob to turn with the minimal amount of implementation that will get us a maximal change. That's kind of why you feel like, oh, a small tweak somewhere, you get a very outsized impact but part of that is part of the design so that we can respond quickly too. Okay, we're coming up to the um, the end of the hour and I got special permission for us to overrun, but I think um, as the conversation in the chat naturally turns to discussions of chat GPT, um, uh, which is the default techie conversation, um, it probably means that we're... Um, we're coming to the, uh, the the end of this discussion. I won't. I will make one meta note, which I found it really interesting. I was anticipating a big discussion about CDM. I was anticipating a big discussion about governance, and actually, the discussion in the chat, and I hope I I tried my best to reflect it, has really been about Phil Plus, right? And in particular, um, if Phil Plus is going to be the vehicle by which we incentivize genuine storage um, uh, with customers, uh, uh, how, how we should go about doing that and whether that, that we need other strategies too. Um, I'm gonna say that that is, an, that is a huge conversation in its own right. We've heard from Galen and uh, deep in the chat. And I think that would be, that would be a fascinating thing to have another uh, AMA around. Um, I'm going to open it up once again, because I know that the, that we have a lot of people involved in Fit56 here right now. You've got amazing experts. So if anybody does want to ask a question, now is your time to ask um, before the uh, the final uh, consensus decision. So uh, uh, last call for questions. Really last call this time. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't see anyone. Um, so I'm sure someone will jump out and tell me if there's someone crying out to help. Um, uh, Caitlin, I think I'm going to pass it back to you if that's the case. All right, Danny, I'm glad to take it back. Um, that was a really interesting conversation. I feel like these ones always are. Um, any kind of crypto economic proposal is always um, quite complicated. And so thanks to the Crypto Econ Lab team and also to Danilo for walking us through um, these really nuanced arguments. Uh, this, I believe, brings us to the end of all of our scheduled programming today. So if anyone else has any final thoughts, comments, or anything they want to share, now is your time to interrupt me. Otherwise, we are going to adjourn for today. Uh, if you have questions after this, obviously, you can DM me, you can ping any one of us in Slack, you can ask your question publicly, of course. Um, and as mentioned and requested, we're going to save the chat from this as well. So along with the recording, all of the material shared here today should be made public. Um, and in terms of next steps for Fit56, 
uh, stay tuned to the Phil Phipps channel. We're going to be opening up public documentation really, really shortly and determining whether the FIP is accepted or rejected based on community consensus uh, next Thursday, April 6th. That is the end of the last call period. So get your thoughts, comments, et cetera, in now. And otherwise, have a wonderful day, evening, wherever it is where you are. Thanks.